Hey, stay on your feet for just a second. We're, we're doing a thing right now, if you're just walking into it, called Family Forward. Our church is on a year-long journey to move forward in every part of life. We just decided, you know what? We're tired of talking about the good old days before the virus. We're tired of trying to get back to how it used to be. We've got a brand new baseline and it is time to move forward in life. Who's with me? And so the years kind of split up into different areas of life. And right now we're talking about family, how to move our families forward. And uh, we're going to Joshua chapter 24 for kind of our baseline. And this is at the end of Joshua's life. He's given this last hurrah talk right before he passes away to the nation of Israel. And if you go and you kind of look at where they were, I think it's very interesting that he chose to talk about family. I want you to read these words with me. He says, here we go. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, I know it's like time change weekend, but I want y'all to do better than that. So I'm gonna give you a second chance, okay? Let's just read the last part together, starting with as for me and my house. Here we go, you ready? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Turn to your neighbor, say, as for me and my house. Turn to your other neighbor, say, we will serve the Lord. Turn back to the first neighbor, say, you look good today. Turn to the other neighbor again, say, you need sleep, right? I'm just trying to get y'all to interact a little bit, all right? Let's welcome our Church Online family real quick. We're glad you guys are with us. We've got military all over the world joining in. Thank y'all so much for being here. Um, can I just pray for us and then we'll, we'll grab a seat after that and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church family. God, thank you for mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and grandparents and singles and just everybody in the room. God, teenagers, Father, we want to move forward in life. God, we're ready to receive your truth today, even when it's not popular, even when it's hard to receive. God, we know that we need it. We know that you're good. We know that you love us. And so, Father, we're open up our, our hearts and our minds right now. Come on, would you just pray this with me? God, I'm ready. I open my heart. I open my mind. God, I'm ready for your word. I'm ready for your truth. Change me, God. Make me better. Help my family. We want to move forward in Jesus' name. Come on, give God one more shout of praise. Amen. You can grab a seat. And there's one of these on a seat close to you. I want to show it to you just real quick. We have our student summer camp coming up. Yeah, in June. And something really cool this year that we were able to make happen. Uh, camp is expensive, y'all. It takes a lot of money to get the buses and the facility and the chicken nuggets and just all the stuff that it takes to do uh, camp and the leadership and um, it's usually like 450 or 500 bucks to get students to camp. We were able to get it down to the, the early rate, 300 bucks per student. That's a big, big deal. And I want to just shout out our team for doing such a great job with that. And you might be sitting there like you're kind of ignoring me right now because you don't have a, a student, seventh grade to 12th grade. But I want to tell you about an opportunity you do have, whether you have a student or not, you could sponsor a student. Even if you can't do 300 bucks, you could sponsor a student to go to camp, talk to anyone on our team afterwards about that, and uh, we would be honored to help you sponsor a student that maybe doesn't have all of the funds that it takes to go to camp, and uh, you could get them there so they can have an encounter with God. Amen? We think it's important. We think it matters. We're talking about family. Here's what we're doing right now. We are going each week to Matthew chapter 5, which is a section of Jesus' most famous sermon, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you've heard of that. And this section of the sermon Jesus gave is called the Beatitudes. Who's ever heard of the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes are basically a list of these different virtues and values that Jesus says, if you will take these things and live them out, like actually apply them to your life, you will be blessed. Now, show of hands, who would say, I wish I could say my family's blessed. Like, I would love to be able to say, I have a blessed family. Come on, if your hand's not up, like, you're crazy, right? Like, we would all want to say, yes, my family is blessed. Well, Jesus literally gives us exactly what we need in the Beatitudes to be able to say that about our families. We want to move our families forward. And so today, we're going to talk about pure hearts. Everybody say pure hearts. Pure hearts. What's interesting to me is as parents... Uh, we would all do anything to protect our children physically. Men in the room, we have this thing built into us where we feel 
this duty to protect our wives, our kids, and we would do it to the death if we had to, right? Most mamas in here, like if you're like my little sweet wife, you would jump on the back of a grizzly bear if you had to, to protect your kids. Amen, ladies? Like she, she might not look fierce, but y'all been married to her almost 22 years. She is, trust me. Okay, and I'm not sure she'd jump on a grizzly bear's back for me, but she would for the kids. But I can run faster than her, so that's okay. It's just a joke, guys. You ever heard of a joke? We're having fun, okay? So it's interesting to me, in the world today, like we'd be very concerned about protecting our kids physically, but I want to ask you are, you, are you concerned about your family's hearts? About their heart? In the world today, you would be applauded for going to great lengths to protect your family physically, but in the world today, we are also laughed at for protecting our kids when it comes to their morality, when it comes to their hearts. The devil we know comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take away purity in our families. He wants to destroy the hearts of our children. So what did Jesus say? We want to bless family. What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. This is today's beatitude. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, in the original language, the Greek, the word heart that he used, this is important, is the word cardia. What does that sound like? Cardiac, right? We use the word cardiac as a prefix in the medical field to describe the actual physical heart. Now, Jesus was not talking about the actual poo -poo, poo -poo, physical heart. Jesus was talking about the other thing we refer to as the heart, that soulish part of who you are that includes things like your emotions and your feelings. Uh, you might describe it as the inner self, okay? It includes your, your attitudes, your motives, it includes your ideologies that you've adopted into your mind, your mindset, right? It includes um, everything that you are and all that you are. It includes your worldview, what you think about the worldview around you. And really, all that is just scratching the surface of what Jesus was covering metaphorically when he said, the heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, here's what's interesting. When it comes to the heart that Jesus was talking about. In the world today, there are two ideas about the heart that are polar opposites of what the Bible teaches us about the heart. Idea number one, the world says, follow your heart. Who's ever heard that? Who's ever given that advice out? Hey man, it's good. I just think you should follow your heart. It sounds good. Uh, the intentions behind the idea are maybe even good. Follow what you're feeling. Follow what feels right. Follow what is comfortable for you. Follow what's convenient in your heart. Can I just tell you, the truth of God's word tells us that is a very bad idea. To follow your heart. Why? The condition of your heart is always changing. Will, will you be honest about that? I will. Right? The condition of your heart, it, it's always uh, in this constant state of change. And so follow your heart if you want, but what it will lead to most likely is unhealthy relationships, really dumb financial decisions. Anybody ever followed their heart and made one of those? You're like, yeah, it's out in the parking lot, right? Drove it to church, right? <laughs> Follow your heart, and you'll make these kinds of decisions. Follow your heart, and you might end up in the completely wrong job for the wrong reasons. The Bible actually says the opposite. Don't follow your heart. Instead, here's some Bible ideas if you want to jot them down. Learn wisdom. Establish guardrails and boundaries. Find some good examples of godly men and women and look at what's worked for them and observe that and maybe adopt some of their principles and precepts. Search the scriptures. Know God's word. 
but don't follow your heart. In Matthew 16, Jesus said this, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your heart. You have to give up your own way. This is part of the decision to follow Jesus, to be a Jesus follower. Give all that up. Instead, take up your cross, and Jesus says, follow him. If you try to hang on to your life, your heart, all that stuff you want, your own way, you'll actually lose all of it. But if you'll give all that up, if you'll give up your life, what you want, your ways, what your heart is saying for his sake, he says, you'll save it. You'll save all of it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your heart, you lose your soul? Is there anything worth more than this in your life? Is there anything worth more than your kid's heart and soul in this life? than the heart and the soul of your spouse in this life. So the world says, follow your heart. Horrible wisdom. And completely the opposite of a Christian worldview. Secondly, the world says, you and I have a good heart. How many of you have ever said, well, yeah, he messed up, but the guy's got a good heart. Who's ever, I, I, I literally said it this week after writing this sermon. <laughs> yeah, but they have a, a good heart. We say that. The world teaches that. Here's what the world teaches today. The world teaches that you and I have a good heart, but that society somehow corrupts that good heart. That it's not really your fault. That you're not really responsible for it. Society does it to you. But listen, if you're a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, that is not a Christian worldview. If you have a Christian worldview, you have to believe there's not a single person you've ever met with a good heart. Not even your sweet grandma, okay? Not even grandma. Sorry. Sorry, I just had to say it, all right? A Christian worldview is that none of us have a good heart. Look at Jeremiah 17. It says the human heart <laughs> is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. And then he's like, it's so bad. Who really knows how bad it is? It's so scary. Who really knows how bad it is? And then God says, but I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. So listen, the Christian worldview about our hearts is that we have a default autopilot setting of broken, nasty, jacked up, and in need of major rescue. Why? Because of the entrance of sin into the human story. I am giving you Christianity 101. And I'll just tell you, parents especially, so often in today's world when you're fighting some of the stuff that we are fighting, some of these battles we are fighting, some of these ideologies that we're having to work through, if you will simply go back to the most basic aspects and theologies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll be able to straighten out a lot of it. And this is one of them. Because think about how worldly, how wicked, think about how crooked the path of life gets if you believe that you got one of these that's just really good. Because you start to trust this instead of God. We need to understand from a Christian worldview, from a biblical standpoint, theologically, God has taught us that sin has rendered our hearts untrustworthy. That's not a popular truth today, but something doesn't have to be popular for it to be true. It might not be popular, but it's still true. It's still what God's word says. So don't fall for these two beliefs. Follow your heart. After all, you've got a good one. The truth is there is no such thing as a pure heart without Jesus Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, again, this is Christianity 101. There is no such thing as a good heart, a pure heart, without the forgiveness, the grace, the cross of Jesus Christ. What happens when we start to believe we do have good hearts and we should trust our heart? Look at what it says happened in Ephesians 4 to the Gentiles. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind 
of impurity. So, so it says their minds are full of darkness. It's gotten so bad that they have literally closed their minds. How many of you have walked into a movie theater like on a hot, sunny summer afternoon and you can't see anything because you came, it's so bright outside. Who's had this experience? And then you get into the dark theater and you're like, don't spill the candy we snuck in here, kids. Okay, like, is it, come on, that's funny. I don't, don't look at me like you ain't sneaking candy into the theater, all right? I know you're holy, but not that holy, okay? And that's why they got the little lights on the stairs, because they know it takes time for your eyes to adjust, but it doesn't take that long, does it? Before you know it, you can see perfectly fine in that really dark movie theater. I want to ask you a question. Could it be in your family, the reason you can't honestly say we are a blessed family is because there is some separation from God, at least in some area of your family, and the reason there's that separation from God in that area of your family is that your eyes have adjusted, your heart has adjusted to the darkness. The darkness in the world, the darkness in culture that masquerades itself as truth, and it's actually gotten so bad, you've adjusted to it so well that you, you haven't just adjusted, and, and you're, it's not like you're just in it, you, you've literally brought it in to your heart. And so now when someone proclaims the truth of the word of God, instead of receiving it and your life being changed, you just get upset or you just get mad and your heart just shuts down. You just shut off. You, next thing it said, you, no sense of shame. Okay, listen, no parent in here would, would give their baby a bottle of formula mixed with just a little bit of poison. You wouldn't do that. And no family in here would tell your kids to go swim in the pool in the backyard if there was just just a 20% acid mixed into it, right? Like you would never do that, okay? Absolutely, you'd never do that. But many parents will let their 15-year-old daughter go on a date and they don't know where that daughter's going and they don't know the guy she's going with. Uh, many, many parents would give their teenage son one of these, with zero parameters, zero limits, zero filters. Y'all, I'm almost 41 years old. My wife has filters set on my phone. There's a reason for that. There's a reason. I know that I have a propensity to warm up to the darkness in the world and that the stuff you used to have to go to some smutty shop when I was a kid to get, I, you just get it right there now. And many parents will just hand their kids, here you go and never think about it, never think about it. Many parents will give their, their kid a money, to, money to go see a movie or whatever it might be, right? Like here, go, go to this concert, but never look at what the movie is, what the content is, never think about the, the concert. What does this band sing about? I'm just saying, could it be one reason that you can't say your home is blessed? Could one of the reasons be your heart's been hardened? And like, I'm saying this stuff and you're going, really, he's going to talk about like music and movies? Are you serious? Could it be your heart has been hardened? It's adjusted to the darkness. It's adjusted to the impurity. Because remember, the goal is not to say we have a Christian family. I know tons of families that say we are a Christian family. And when I look at them, I'm like, I see the family, but I don't see the Christian. That's not the goal. Anybody can say that. Tons of people say that. The goal is to lead a Christ-centered home. Those are two different things. I've got a much higher goal for you as a part of this church family. I don't want you leaving, you know, we're Christians, we're a Christian family, we go to Revolution Church. I want you leaving saying we're striving to lead a God-centered home and we, we're a part of the Revolution Church family. So again, culture says, follow your heart. You, you got a good one, but when you do that, you'll follow your heart right out of marriage into adultery. Follow your heart, you got a good one. When you do that, you'll follow your heart right out of years of sobriety back into addiction. Follow your heart, you, you got a good one, but when you do that, you'll follow your heart right out of holiness into whatever insanity is the devil wants to use to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. And then look at Psalm 119, it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? I mean, that's a question. When, when I hear Jesus say, Blessed are those who are pure. And I understand my propensity towards sin and the darkness and that I could never be pure on my own. My next question is, how do I do that? Like, how do I actually live a life of purity? The Bible says, by guarding it according 
to your word, to God's word. With my whole heart, I seek you, God. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Today, the world says, hey, everybody should be able to do whatever they want because everybody's got a good heart and everybody should just follow their heart. But we all know that's a recipe for disaster. Some of that is literally playing out on the world stage before our eyes in real time today. Part of the reason we are where we are is we got into this cultural moment where it became everybody should be able to do whatever they want, regardless, not hurting anybody else. But the next step is always hurting everybody else. I ain't got to talk about Vladimir Putin and, and the Ukraine. And th listen, you trace it back, it all starts with this belief. My heart's right. My heart's good. I got a good one. What's happening is today people are trying to build lives of righteousness on a foundation of sin. You don't build a life of righteousness on a foundation of sin. It never works. You don't build a life of righteousness on a foundation of sin. Many people try that but it will never work. A foundation of sin will always come crashing down. So let's take it back to our families because we would say, we're putting our hands up, right? I want a family that I can call blessed. That would be amazing. Jesus said, blessed are those who are pure in heart. How do we do it? How do we create a, a culture of purity in our homes in the middle of a culture that doesn't really care about purity. How do we do it? Look, look at Proverbs chapter four. I'm gonna give you three things. There's many more, but this is what we got time for today. It says, guard your heart above all else. Whose heart? Whose heart, church? Guard your own heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. One translation says, keep your heart with all vigilance. And so the first thing we learn, if we're gonna build lives of righteousness, if we're going to create a culture of purity in our home, is you've got to get your own heart right. Are we working uh, with our, our children and our communities and, and our spouse? Absolutely. Do we care about their heart? Yes. But how are we ever going to change someone else's heart, help somebody else with their heart, if, we're, if our own heart's not right? We have to get our own heart right first. How does that work? It's hard, isn't it? So hard, I'm gonna give you an example that might seem a little weird, but I'm gonna go back to movies. So in most families, uh, there's one spouse that's a lot better at like the judge of content, what's okay and what's not okay than the other spouse. I just happen to be the one that's not as good at that. <laughs> Where are my people at, okay? Like, come on, make a confession right now. Ooh, lots of liars in the room, okay. So I will let my wife check out the movie before we take the kids, or I'll let my wife speak into that. And it, I mean, if she just gives me a look, we'll, we'll leave. If I'm watching something and she's like, what? I'll just, I'll just turn it off right then and there, okay? Why? Because she's a better, a better judge of that. And I was watching this movie years ago. I'll never forget. And as I was watching it, I felt the Holy Spirit convict me that I was being entertained by sin. That I'm, I'm watching sinful things play out on a television screen, laughing, having fun, being entertained by sin. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's comedy, man. It's comedy. Like, it's just funny. They don't mean it. But listen, just because something's funny doesn't somehow suddenly make wrong things become right things. Can I get an amen? And that's just my example that we've all been deceived in some way. And we all have areas where we need to allow God to speak to us about the purity of our hearts. With movies, a lot of parents today will say, well, my kid's like six years old. It's just going all over their head. No, it's not. They're picking it up in little bitty slices. And if you'll think long-term, instead of just 90-minute movie blocks with me, you'll be able to see the damage that these things can do over time to our families and the impurities that we let into our families. Again, that's just one example, but we all have something. And some of us need to cry out today to God and say, God, Convict me about my attitudes. God, convict me about my spending habits. God, convict me about uh, my, my friends, the group of friends I have that haven't, haven't helped me in this life. God, convict me about uh, the websites that I have been visiting. Father, convict me about the entertainment. God, get my heart right. God, create in me a heart of purity. Renew my mind, God. I want to lead my family to move forward, but I know that I can't do that if my own heart is not right before you. That's the first one. Okay, here's the second one. First Samuel, 
1 Samuel chapter 16 says, the Lord sees not as man sees. Okay, so God looks at things differently than we do. And we forget that. Like we're so good at just assuming God sees everything our way. Rarely does he. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance. That's what we're always focused on. But the Lord looks on the what church? God looks at the heart. He always looks at the heart first and foremost. God is is fanatical about the heart. Jesus was fanatical about the heart. And and so I want to tell you this. The second thing, this is for the parents, okay? I are one. I understand, all right? Parent to the heart. We need to parent to this right here, to the hearts of our children. Most parents don't do that. If you think about your parenting, I bet you don't do this. Most parents parent to the actions, So most parents don't step in and actually parent until the child does something that they don't want them to do or doesn't align with family values or rules or whatever, and then respond to the action. That will never work long term. Do you got to respond to the action? Yeah, absolutely. But that should never be the focus. The focus should be right here, the heart. Always, always, always on the heart. Jesus focused on this. So the Old Testament said, hey, um, do not commit adultery. Jesus said, yeah, that's a given. It's not just don't commit adultery. It's don't even look at a woman lustfully in your heart. Your heart. He always took it back to the heart. Old Testament, don't murder anybody. Okay, I hope that's a given in our church. All right, like murder's bad. Don't murder anybody. Jesus said, yeah, don't murder anybody, obviously, but don't even hate someone in your heart. He always took it back to the heart. And then there was this group he was always butting heads with. They're called the Pharisees. And here's what he said to them in Luke chapter 11, because they were always so worried about the outside, never the inside. Jesus said, you're so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy full of greed and wickedness. And then he calls them fools. Y'all thought Jesus was all meek and mild and nice and soft-spoken all the time. He's like, fools, punks, idiots. That's what y'all are. Why? Because you're only worried about the outside. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? Jesus hammered the Pharisees for this, for only ever looking at the outside. He said, you're absolute hypocrites. You need to worry about the heart. And the biggest mistake I see today in parenting is that we parent outwardly only. Like we're more worried about what they're wearing and the color of their hair or whatever than we are about their heart. I'm not saying you shouldn't have any rules. Every home needs rules and boundaries. And they need to be very clear. But first and foremost, we parent to the heart. Because if you don't, here's what you'll get. You will get outward submission, but inward rebellion. And so this is where you say to your kid, like, um, no, you're not going to the party tonight. And they say, okay, I understand. But I hate you, mom. No, you got a parent to the heart. Okay. It's not just that you're not going to the party. You ain't gonna say you, I hate you, mom. You know what I tell my kids if they say that? I say, that's my wife. You just said that. I don't say that's your mom. Okay. Now it's me protecting my wife. We about to throw down. All right. (laughs) Hey, honey, you are not wearing that. Okay, I'll change, but it's just because you're old and you don't understand fashion. What are you seeing? You're seeing an inward issue, a heart issue, okay? Hey, apologize to your brother. I'm sorry, you big dumb idiot. (laughs) Clearly, there's a heart issue, And it's not acceptable. We parent to the heart because the heart matters most. When the heart is right, the right things come out of the heart. Do you see that? And this is why you have so many Christian parents raise their kids in the church. Their kids go off to college and it's completely crazy. It's because that child changed outwardly, but there was zero inward change. And so when you set the little butterfly loose, the inward rebellion came out. Do you understand? And some of you, you can nod your head yes, because I'm literally describing you. And this isn't about whether or not they're perfect. It's about our parenting. And it's about the wisdom God's given us. We parent to the heart. We want to parent for outward change and focus and rules. Yeah, all that, but even more so, the heart, the heart. Can I get an amen? Amen. So we're going to get our own hearts right. We're going to parent to the heart. Okay, last one. I'll take you to Ephesians 5. 
And this scripture uses sexual immorality kind of as the example. So it's pretty intense, but here's what it says. Let there be how much? How much church? No. No. Zero. Zilch. None, right? Let there be no sexual immorality, no impurity, no greed, and he could keep going, among you. Such sins, these are the ones he chose as the example here, such sins have no place among God's people. What is the Bible telling us? Listen very closely. The Bible is telling us anything less than absolutely perfect purity is impurity. Did you get that? Anything less in God's sight, because remember, God is perfectly holy, than absolutely perfect perfection, perfect purity in every way is not purity. And so here's, here's what I want to tell you last, okay? Look at this very closely. Pursue perfect purity of heart. What's that first word? Pursue. I want to make sure you see the first word. Pursue perfect purity of heart. Okay, because we have to admit, as we spoke about earlier, none of us can ever be perfectly pure. Not you, not me, not a single one of us. We need to acknowledge that. If we could be perfectly pure, why would we need Jesus? Why would we need the cross? If we could do what the world says we can do and be perfectly pure and have a good heart and follow our heart and everything just kind of work out and be okay, why would we need Jesus. We cannot achieve perfect purity, but here's what we can do. We can have the heart God desires headed in the right direction, pursuing perfect purity. God sees the heart. He knows it. And the heart that God wants to see, it's so clear all over scripture, is a heart that pursues perfect purity. Here's the best story I could think about as an example. It's not a great story, but I'll give it to you anyway, okay? So there's this little boy, seventh grader. He wants to go see this movie, R-rated movie with his friends. That's got a lot of uh, content. Maybe he shouldn't go see it. He comes to his mom, I'm gonna go see this movie tomorrow night. And she says, what's it rated? He says, it's rated R. She says, let me just kind of look it up. She's like, you're not gonna see this. And he says, mom, I looked it up too. There's, it's not a big deal. There's just one sex scene and, you know, only, only the woman's naked. The guy's not. So, I mean, you know, we're good there. And then, like, it's about four seconds long. I looked it up. That's the sex scene. And then the F-bomb just a few times, just a few times. And then, like, the, the illicit drug use, it's just a little bit of the movie. Just a little bit of the movie. Just a couple parts. And mom says, I'll tell you what. You can go to the movie with your friends tomorrow night. But tonight we're having family dinner and I'm making your favorite dessert, chocolate cake. The boy gets excited. He's like, I love chocolate. Okay, mom, what time's dinner? She says six o'clock. He says, I'll see you at six. So he goes, plays with his friends. Hey, we're going to the movie tomorrow night. It's going to be incredible. I can't wait to see it with you guys. Goes home at six. They sit down. They have this amazing dinner as a family. Great conversation. She brings out the chocolate cake. Little boy's so excited. He's about to get his favorite dessert. Hasn't had it in a long time. She tells him, hey, I just want you to know before you take that first bite of chocolate cake, when I was baking it, I went out to the yard and I got just a little piece of dog poop, just a little bitty one. Like not even Tootsie Roll size, it's tiny. I got like a pinhead piece of dog poop and I put it in the chocolate cake batter. And the boy's like, I'm not eating this. It's got dog poop in it. And she says, yeah, but it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. The boy knew mom had him. He's like, okay, I get the point. I won't go to the movie. The the point of the story is a little dog poop goes a long way. That's the point of the story, all right? Now, what did the Bible say? How much impurity? Zero. Zero. One translation says there must be not even a hint of impurity. Not even a little bit further illustrating to you and I our need for a perfect Savior named Jesus Christ dying on a cross, shedding his blood, forgiving us that we can't do it on our own. That's all God requires if you're wondering. Absolute perfection. No dog poop mixed in there at all, okay? That's what he wants. Absolute perfect purity. So since Paul in Ephesians used Sexual impurity as an example. I'm going to ask you a few questions using that same example. Would sleeping with many people before marriage be even a hint of immorality? That's not very many yeses. Okay. Would sleeping with just one person before marriage be even a hint of sexual immorality? Better. Would sleeping with only your fiance after 
putting a ring on it and getting engaged, but you're not married yet, be even a little bit of sexual impurity? Would looking at pornography be just a hint? Would thinking about someone lustfully when you think about the words of Jesus be just a hint? Okay, the question is, how much impurity do you want there to be in your family's life? That's the question. When Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, this is what he's talking about. How much impurity are you okay letting in to your kids' lives, your, your, your spouse's life? How much, how much poison are you okay with them ingesting on a daily basis? The answer is zero for all of us. I mean, we're processing it, but the answer, we would all say, yeah, none. I get it, pastor. I don't want to let anything into their heart that will misguide them, misdirect them, mess them up, teach them something contrary to what God's word teaches us because I believe God's way is the best way. That's why I'm a Christ follower. That's why I'm trying to lead a God-centered family. Amen? Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. And then he said, this is just a cool little extra for you this week. He said, for they will see God. That's amazing. We know from Exodus chapter 33, nobody can see God and live. So the fact that Jesus would choose these words to these people that, that would have known this, this random thing from the book of Exodus, no one can see God and live. It, it would have stuck out to them. Now, he wasn't saying physically see God and live. He was saying that when you have a pure heart before God, you start to understand God better. You start to crave his ways over yours. You start to really experience God and grow closer to him and see his blessings and kind of connect all the dots. And then you just want more of him, more of him and less of you, more of his purity. You want to pursue that less of the trash that the world pushes. And I I really believe in a message like this in today's culture, there's a couple things happening. Maybe you're the person pushing back a little. I just want to ask you, could it be that your heart has grown hard and that your heart has adjusted to the cultural darkness, at least in some area. Could it be that what God is saying to you today is it's time to wake up and to pursue perfect purity and to trust God to help you do that? It says in Ezekiel 36, this is God speaking to his people. He says, I will give you a new heart. God does heart surgery, y'all. Come on, who knows how good he is, how he can change anything. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. He, he, he's, he's saying, I will, for us, those of us in Christ, I'll literally put my Holy Spirit inside of you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and I'll give you a tender and responsive heart that can actually change. And I'll put my spirit, there is it again, I'll put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulation. God, what I'm saying is God can change your heart if you'll allow him to. He can change it. Another kind of person, maybe you're very responsive today and what you're saying is, Pastor, the, the examples you gave today, like I am way past that. I have messed up so bad when it comes to purity. I've done much more horrible things than you mentioned today. Psalm 51 says, create in me a pure heart. Oh God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. God can bring that steadfast spirit because of his Holy Spirit in you. He can bring that brand new pure heart if you will let him. And so I want to pray like this. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you're just saying today, God change my heart, because I want to lead my family forward in any way. The application could be very different based on who you are. I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. God, if you're just saying, God, I want a Christ-centered family, not just a Christian family in name, a Christ-centered life, a Christ-centered family. Father, I lift up every person that has lifted their hand. God, they are trusting you with their purity. Father, teach us all how to pursue perfect purity and God, change our lives. We want to move our families forward and we confess We've not always done that the way you've commanded us. We've adopted some stuff from the world, but it ends today, God. Today we trust you. We trust your word. God, you are our guide and nothing else. You can put your hands down as you just maybe talk to God about that a little bit. And listen, last kind of person in the room, you can't honestly say that you've had that that personal one-on-one moment with God where you're giving him your life, where you're trusting him with your heart, 
for your salvation. And you're saying, I'd love to have what that pastor's talking about today, a pure heart before God. I would love that. But God could never accept. I gotta, I gotta clean my heart up first. My heart is so full of junk. So I'm gonna tell you, you're actually half right. The part where you're saying, I just feel like I'm, I'm so far from God, so separated. My, my heart is so full of just worldly junk. How could God ever accept me? You're absolutely right about that. The part you're wrong about is the idea that you could somehow clean yourself up or earn your way to God. Because the truth is, God's word tells us, you can't change on your own. You can't give enough to get into heaven. You can't attend church enough to get into heaven. You can't memorize enough Bible verses to get you into heaven. There's nothing you can do to get yourself into heaven. But the good news is Jesus already did it. He finished the work. He lived a perfect life with a perfectly pure heart, the one that we're pursuing. And then he said, he will give you his righteousness. He will literally give you before God the condition of his heart. He'll replace your heart before a holy God so that when God looks at us, he just, he just sees sons and daughters that he loves, that he welcomes into heaven. But you have to have a, a moment where you fully surrender and fully trust God, not yourself. If you've never had a moment like that, we want to give you the opportunity to do so right now. Others of you, in this moment, you're going to come back to God. You're going to recommit to your salvation decision. If that's you, would you just pray like this? Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. God, you are good. I am not. God, you are God. I am not. I trust you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. I repent from my sins. I trust you, God. Create in me a new heart, God. Change my life. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's make some noise for anybody taking that step.